He attempted to convince them to take the drinks, but they firmly declined, aware of the potential consequences. Accepting drinks often led to the men joining their table with further expectations. After enjoying their roast lamb ribs and chicken, one of the men approached them, asking to sit. Once more, they permitted him to do so, but only for a short while. Despite their refusal of the drinks, he suggested they could keep each other company. Alice, growing increasingly frustrated, explained they were there for some quality girl time, discussing topics men might not enjoy. How about we talk about periods, she challenged. He hesitated, saying, I'd rather not, but we could discuss other things. Alice retorted, that's exactly what we're interested in. Despite further attempts, the ladies remained unwavering. Eventually, all five men approached, presuming to join without invitation and even attempting to wedge themselves between the women. The ladies, however, cleverly closed ranks, leaving no room for the unwelcome intrusion. One audaciously mentioned, do you realize who you're rejecting? This man is a minister's driver. Faith dismissed the remark, stating, his employer's status doesn't matter to us. We're here to enjoy our own company. Ignoring their clear refusal, the men ordered drinks for everyone. Seizing a moment, Faith excused herself. As soon as she left, Diane and Alice took the opportunity to leave, explaining their departure was due to the men's insistence. They left the unordered drinks untouched and noticed the men's stares as they exited. Back at Alice's house, they discussed meeting up the next day. Faith had left her car there, and from there, they all headed home, undisturbed by the evening's unwelcome advances. On a sun-drenched Sunday, the gang converged at church, swapping their usual mischief for a dose of holiness before heading to Faith's for a post-service feast. With Faith's mom having made her exit stage left on Friday, the house was all Faith's kingdom. Post-lunch, they sprawled on sun lounges, sipping homemade fruit juice like they were auditioning for a tropical vacation ad, committed to a chill session free from any plot twists. As the sun dipped, they each retreated to their respective homes, probably to continue their relaxation in solitude. For Diane, the week crawled by with the excitement of watching paint dry, save for the buzz of weekend plans with the ladies. They were gearing up for a Friday exodus to Naivasha, with a rendezvous with Mount Longo not slated for Saturday morning. Operation Climb Every Mountain was to kick off from Tony's base camp, where a minibus, the chariot to adventure, awaited at 1 o'clock p.m. opting for cabs to Tony's. The ladies aimed to spare themselves the ordeal of driving back on Sunday, probably fearing their legs would be on strike after the hike. Remarkably, Alice, typically running on her own time zone, miraculously synchronized with everyone else's watches for once. At Tony's, they indulged in a pre-journey coolant, huddling outside while the minibus driver puzzled over their punctuality. With Tony playing Tetris with the luggage in the minibus, they set off, not a minute wasted, their stash of snacks quickly falling victim to a car ride munchies massacre. They checked into the Great Rift Valley Lodge, scoring rooms with views that likely had the local wildlife lining up for photo ops. Post-check-in rituals complete, they congregated at the bar, where cold drinks served as the prelude to an exploratory wander. Dinner called them back, and afterward, the bar played host to their nightcaps and a pact to reconvene at breakfast, pre conquest. Tony and Diane, seizing the moment like it was a Black Friday sale, stealthily made their escape. Tony, channeling his inner romantic hero, swept Diane off her feet, literally, before navigating the lock like it was the final challenge in a reality show. Inside, shoes barely off, Tony orchestrated a passionate scene that would have romance novelists nodding in approval. The others, sensing the night was winding down, gradually dispersed in a strategic retreat to their rooms. Come dawn, they assembled like a team of slightly sleep-deprived superheroes, ready to face Mount Longonat. Meeting their hiking guides, they underwent a crash course in mountain climbing 101 before embarking. Thirty minutes in, the mountain revealed its true colors as a formidable foe, challenging their pre-hike bravado with the harsh reality of gravity and incline. The climb turned into a roasting session, with everyone dishing out jokes like they were free samples. By the time they conquered the peak, they were gasping for air like fish out of water, pausing to soak in the view which, admittedly, stole whatever breath they had left. Water, pausing to soak in the view which, admittedly, stole whatever breath they had left. The vista from atop the mountain was so stunning, they half expected it to demand royalties for the privilege. Peering into the crater of the slumbering volcano felt like spying on nature's private quarters. The descent, thankfully, was less of a battle and more of a leisurely stroll back to reality. By the base, even the self-proclaimed fitness gurus were admitting defeat, their energy levels mirroring their phone batteries after a day of heavy use. 
The ride back was eerily silent, save for unanimous praise for the adventure and half-baked promises to tackle another mountain, with Tony being voluntold as the next trip planner due to his smashing success with this one. The afternoon's ambitious golf plans wilted faster than a salad in the sun, with everyone unanimously deciding that lifting a cold drink was the extent of their physical capabilities. As they lounged, a quail, oblivious to its audience, strutted into view. Tony, seizing a teachable moment, quizzed the group on the bird's name in Kikuyu, leading to a comical scramble for smartphones and Bible apps, only to realize they were barking up the wrong linguistic tree. The revelation that it was called Kamaki or Rome, man scarer, sent theories flying about its fearsome reputation, proving laughter is the best recovery after a mountain conquest. Dinner plans were laid out for an early departure, with a strategic early lunch to fuel the journey back. As night fell, the group began retiring in waves, with Robert and Alice leading the charge, hinting at dessert plans that had nothing to do with the menu. Tony, too, had dessert on his mind, walking Diane to their room with a look that said the night was young. The next day, after a communal breakfast and a leisurely stroll, they packed up, checked out, and reluctantly piled into the minibuses, nursing a collective case of trip too short syndrome. Back home, the farewells were drawn out, with Diane lingering for dinner at Tony's, where he played chef, whipping up a chicken dish that probably deserved its own Instagram post. Meanwhile, Robert and Brian extended their hospitality, turning dinner into an episode of The Bachelor, the home edition. In the end, everyone agreed the trip was a snapshot of life at its best, exhausting, exhilarating, and entirely too short, with promises to do it all over again, perhaps after their muscles forgave them. Post-dinner, Tony chauffeured Diane back to her place, where she promptly dove into the rejuvenating embrace of a shower before collapsing into bed, her exhaustion tinged with a hint of sadness over how swiftly the weekend had flown by, despite its packed itinerary of fun. Come Monday, Diane's routine at work took an exciting turn as the managing director summoned her with news that Tuesday would find her jetting off to Mombasa for a pitch. The company had taken care of all travel arrangements, including her stay and transportation, setting her up for a three-day stint with a side mission to check in on another client. While Diane enjoyed Mombasa's vibes with her squad, solo business trips that didn't quite hit the same note of fun. Sharing the news with Tony, Faith, and Alice, she was immediately bombarded with requests for souvenirs. That evening, Diane embarked on the strategic task of packing, with every outfit thoughtfully paired with just the right accessories. The next morning, corporate chariot in the form of the company car whisked her away to the airport. Diane's return on Friday was marked by a brief stop at the office to unload and catch up with the MD before she ducked out early, buoyed by the prospect of a dinner date with Tony. Tony, donning the chef's hat for the evening, insisted on commandeering the kitchen, an offer Diane welcomed without hesitation. She even gave her house help a well-deserved night off. Tony arrived ahead of time, finding Diane already refreshed and lounging in something comfy. He ushered her to the kitchen stool, promising an evening of culinary pampering. With a flourish, he poured wine into two glasses, one for each of them, showcasing his kitchen prowess that was as intuitive as it was impressive, no doubt honed during his bachelor days in the States. His cooking revealed a man who knew his way around a kitchen, navigating Diane's pots, pans, and utensils with a seasoned ease. It was clear, if there was one thing Tony couldn't stand, it was the mundane existence of baked beans. Tony, in a move straight out of a rom-com, decided to channel his inner master chef with a Chinese stir-fry, armed with nothing but his wits and a bouquet of red roses that Diane couldn't help but adore. Post-dinner, he whipped out a gift box, throwing Diane into a whirlwind of confusion. It wasn't her birthday, and the last time she checked, Santa was still on vacation. The only boxes she usually received were from the girls, stuffed with who knows what. Her curiosity piqued, she unwrapped the mystery box to find keys. Not just any keys, but the keys to the Fortress of Solitude, Tony's place. Speechless, Diane then learned of Tony's next surprise, a meet and greet with two VIPs in his life. Before she could speculate about any long-lost relatives or secret pets, he dropped the bombshell, it was time to meet the parents. Diane's mind raced faster than a bargain hunter on Black Friday, but ultimately, she agreed, wondering if this was all an elaborate dream. Tony, seemingly on a quest to fill every moment with surprises, mentioned a rendezvous with his cousins the next day, promising a call to Diane for a dinner sequel. After he left, Diane's day took a turn towards the mundane as she caught up with her cousin Naomi from El Duret, proving life wasn't all roses and key-giving ceremonies. Their catch-up session at Westgate turned into a time-traveling chat, only interrupted by Tony's timely reminder of the evening plans. 
Fast forward to dinner at Tony's, where the aroma of cooking greeted Diane at the gate, and Tony, still donning his apron, became the target of her playful banter. Conversations flowed around future plans and daydreams, though Diane drew the line at the suggestion of an upscale family restaurant in Kiambu, labeling it a potential marriage breaker. Instead, she championed the idea of investing in real estate, a venture with seemingly no cap on success. Their Sunday played out like a scene from a cozy Sunday morning ad, complete with breakfast in bed and a shared bath, before Diane returned to her routine, leaving behind the weekend's whirlwind of events. Back in the realm of the everyday, Faith and Alice reconnected with Diane for a gossip session over the phone, proving that no matter how extraordinary the weekend, there's nothing like a catch-up with the girls to bring you back down to earth. As the week zipped by, the girls opted for an early dinner in Westlands on Friday, winding down prematurely because Diane had a big day ahead, meeting Tony's parents was on the agenda. Post-dinner, she headed home for a restful night, sealing the evening with a call to Tony and setting their rendezvous for 1 p.m. the next day. Saturday morning found Diane selecting a halter neck dress and sandals for the occasion. After fueling up with breakfast and a pep talk with the girls, she readied herself, her anticipation peaking just as Tony signaled his arrival. Their destination was Tony's parents' residence in Spring Valley, but not before a pit stop at Westgate. Diane, adhering to Kikuyu customs, didn't want to show up empty-handed, her nerves jangling all the while. Tony's soothing presence, coupled with his light-hearted attempt to lift her spirits, tried to smile. You don't want to resemble a grumpy mule, do you? Drew a smile from Diane, albeit a jittery one. Arriving at Tony's folks, they were greeted by an imposing white mansion, guarded by a duo of security personnel and surrounded by a floral masterpiece of a garden. Tony's mother, exuding warmth, welcomed Diane with open arms, her father following suit. The house was a sight to behold, with a living room that opened to a lush garden and boasted a vibrant fish tank. As they sipped on homemade lemonade, Tony's father showcased the grounds, including a cleverly designed fish tank system that fed into an outdoor pond, complete with a gazebo and a miniature waterfall for ambience. Lunch was served in an elevated dining area, defined by elegant oak balusters, reflecting the exquisite taste of Tony's mother. Post-lunch conversation flowed in the living room, where a connection was discovered, Tony's dad and Diane's uncle were old colleagues. This serendipitous revelation added a layer of familiarity to the meeting. As the evening came to a close, promises of future visits were exchanged, with Tony's mom expressing a fondness for Diane that mirrored her own mother's warmth. The day, filled with anticipation and nervous excitement, ended on a note of welcomed inclusion and budding familial bonds. Thank you for listening and coming back. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share before you go. See you next week for Part 9.